and just incredible evening. And let me introduce to you now El Paso's premier political blogger. He is making Socorro a big part of his beat, so please welcome to the city of Socorro, Jaime Avedia. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can everyone hear okay? I know this is a little bit loud. We need a little bit louder. Is that better? We're good, we're good. All right, one more big round of applause for our boys in blue over here. It's May Day, so we remember Labor Day. Give them one big round of applause. Okay, we're gonna get right into it this evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to have a very rigorous, spirited debate. We're going to challenge the uh, candidates with tough, probing questions, but we're also gonna maintain the uh, level of co uh, decorum that uh, Socorro is known for. So ladies and gentlemen, behave yourselves tonight. And most importantly, have a good time. Let's get things started off. First question of the evening. Uh, actually, before we do that, we're gonna have uh, the candidates give a one minute introduction. Yes, one minute, because if you can't make your point now after one minute, after this long, then why are you running for office? We'll start uh, on the opposite end with Miss Oaxaca. I'm sorry, before we uh, continue, Dora, we're also gonna pass around questions to the, uh, cards to the audience if you want to ask a question. Please keep it on topic um, and related to the office that they're pursuing. Uh, I'll take a look at the questions and filter through them, that way we don't have any uh, duplicate questions. And we'll get things started with Dora Oaxaca. Hello? Is Buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is Dora Oaxaca. My name is Dora Oaxaca. Soy de la ciudad de Socorro, arriba Socorro. Y orgullosa. I am very proud of being here. Not only that, I was, I was also I also attended the University of Texas at El Paso. I'm a product of my community. Soy un producto de mi comunidad. Soy bilingüe 100% y lo siento de corazón hablar el español. Saber mi cultura, mis raíces. I am a proud bilingual woman that lives in this community, that knows the culture, knows the community, and has worked with all the community leaders. And some of them are here tonight. Y algunos de ustedes, líderes de la comunidad, gracias por haber venido. Gracias. Thank you, Ms. Oaxaca. Move on to Mr. Loya. Muy buenas tardes. Hello. Uh, I think there's a problem with this mic. Pero muy buenas tardes. Yo soy Rodolfo Ruri Loya. Soy candidato para comisionado del distrito número 3. Aquí vivo en Socorro. Pero yo no represento Socorro nomás. Represento todo el valle. Represento San Elisario, Tornillo, Fabens, Sparks, El Paso Hills, Montana Vista, and all our communities. Yo soy un hombre muy trabajador, soy un hombre muy honesto, estoy aquí para representar a la comunidad. Basta con las promesas, ahora son los hechos. Aquí estoy para hacer los hechos para ustedes. Tengo mucha experiencia en budgeting. Es lo que se requiere ahorita porque estamos malgastando el dinero del condado. Necesitamos que enfocarnos para gastar el dinero correctamente, no nomás en proyectos para el paso como Ascarte Park. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Loya. Next, we have State Representative Chente Quintanilla. Can you get his mic on, please? Don't worry, Chente, it's not coming off your time. Coming. Hold on, he's, he's working on it. Give it a try. Go ahead, Chet, give it a try. That wasn't part That wasn't part of my two minutes, was it? I mean, no. It was one minute. Don't try to get another one. Okay, right, no. My name is Chet Quitanilla. I'm a lifelong resident of Corrio, Texas, and I've been with the Colorado Independent School District for the last uh, 37 years, 47 years in public education and, and uh, politics. But you know what, I'd like to take a minute here just to congratulate Dora for her, for uh, her endorsement by Young Democrats. Congratulations, Dora. Uh, you know, most of the Democrats are going to be here, and uh, hopefully they'll, they'll get involved in the process for really young people and uh, all of us older sure. people to get involved in the process. Like I said, I've been in, the, in politics for no less than uh, 27 years, you know, in the last 10 years, state representative, 
and also a community college board member. So yo tengo mucho experiencia ya, ya la experiencia está aquí. Probablemente muchos dicen que ya todo lo hombre de Dios, ya me pasé. Pero yo hasta tengo mucho tiempo que, que darle a la comunidad. Tengo mucho que dar para todos ustedes. So hopefully you will believe in me and continue doing what is best for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quintana. Now we'll continue with Vince Pérez. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the hosts of today's debate. Uh, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to come today. Uh, my father was, in fact, a, a retired police officer for nearly uh, 30 years. Uh, and so the law enforcement community is, is very uh, important to me, very special to me. Uh, I know without my father and without his hard work, uh, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to, to pursue my higher education uh, at Georgetown University. And, and I know my dad had to work very hard, and I understand the struggles of not only law enforcement, but the families as well. And, uh, and so I have tremendous respect for the law enforcement community, and thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, my name is Vince Pettis, candidate for County Commissioner of Precinct 3, a uh, lifelong resident of Precinct 3. I graduated from Miller High School and had the opportunity to study at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., uh, where I received my bachelor's degree and, and, and a master's degree in government. Uh, I previously served as the communications director for Congressman Sylvester Reyes, uh, and it was a tremendous opportunity for me to serve the community I always wanted to come back to El Paso to make a difference because I believe that too often young people leave other cities. El Paso's greatest export is its talent. We lose people to Austin, to Houston, to Dallas, and not, not enough students come back home. So I wanted to buck that trend and come back and make a difference and serve my community. Uh, and that's why, I'm, that's why I'm a candidate for County Commissioner here at Precinct 3. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll get started with the first questions of the evening. Uh, these are my questions. They're going to be challenging and thorough, so we'll get the, we'll get things started off with Mr. Perez. Vince, a good portion, if not a majority, of the constituents of Precinct 3 are monolingual Spanish-speaking or Spanish-dominant. You are not fluent in Spanish. How do you expect to be able to communicate with your constituents? Thank you very much. It's, it's a question that I get often at, at debates. Uh, and people often bring up to me when I spend go, when I go door to door to meet with them. I'll tell you what I heard from one constituent that, that made me think. Uh, I knocked on the door of a constituent, and uh, and she brought up the point. She said, uh, "I've heard you don't speak Spanish." And, and I said, "Well, yes, ma'am. I don't I don't speak it very well." And and she laughed and she says, "Don't worry about it, mijo." She said, "Let me put it this way." She said, "If I were to have surgery, and." I needed to pick a doctor. I'm gonna want the best doctor to perform that surgery on me. And she said, I may have the choice of picking a doctor who speaks Spanish and who I communicate with, but when I have that surgery, I wanna have the best doctor working on me. And she says, and I believe that you're the best person to serve this community whether or not you can speak Spanish. And it got me thinking, I think that's true, is that not only when we pick our doctors, if you need a lawyer to represent you in the courtroom, you want the best attorney possible who's going to go and fight for your interest in that courtroom. You know, you could find a lawyer who speaks Spanish who you might be able to communicate with, but at the end of the day, are you going to want an attorney who's going to do the very best job for you? I think so. Are you going to want a doctor who's going to do the very best for you? I think so. And I think in this race, I'm the best candidate to represent the needs of the people. I may not speak Spanish, but I'm honest, and I'm willing to work hard, and I think the people see that when I go to their door. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Uh, I should mention each candidate has two minutes to respond to the questions that I ask. Moving on to Representative Quintanilla. Representative Quintanilla, you're leaving your position as a state rep to seek another office. You have to earn a pension from the school district and from the state. The salary of the county commissioner is around $60,000 a year. If you were elected, how much total would you receive in compensation per year? $60,000, did you just say that? Including your uh, benefits? Oh, you're talking about what kind of salary I would report to the IRS? Oh, well, uh, I think uh, I'm very proud of what I, 37 years that I worked with some other Penn School District, and 37 years that I served with them, I, uh, I'm receiving a salary of $60,000 from the uh, state of Texas right now, but that's for 37 years of work that I did with them in the school business. I also uh, served uh, in the legislature for the last few years and in the last few years the legislature my salary was six hundred dollars a month for the last 10 years 
So consequently, I made something like uh, maybe not even seventy thousand because my take home pay was three hundred and ninety six dollars. I mean, uh, well, those three hundred ninety six dollars, you know, it cost me money for the last ten years to be there. So I believe and strong believe that uh, a paycheck that is coming from uh, the state of Texas to me is will be well worth it because I've given up my time and uh, effort and money to be a state legislator. It's not easy to travel back and forth, and it costs you money. The per diem that they pay you does not pay for, especially the, the amount of gasoline, uh, the price of gasoline. If, uh, when I become the next commissioner of Precinct 3, I will be receiving a salary something like 60, 65,000. So my God, I mean, you ought to be proud that we have some Hispanics that are getting up in the world. Now, people kept chastising me for getting a second salary or that I'm going to work. Well, I don't believe that at 68 years old I should be put out to pasture. I believe that ya tengo mucho tiempo, todavía tengo mucho que dar yo para esta comunidad. I've given 47 years of my life to the community as a whole and a whole and helping people. And I, then I believe that I still have many, many good years. My friend, Judge Lujan, tells me that I've got another good 12 years to go and that would make me at, at 80. So uh, hopefully, Maybe I will get another retirement from the County of El Paso because I think I will work for it. Thank you, everybody. Mr. Loya, you're right. You're Mr. Loya, you are running in the Democratic primary seeking the nomination of the Democratic Party. Yet as recently as 2004, you voted in the Republican Party. Why did you vote in that election as a Republican, and why are you now running as a Democrat? That's why we live in the great nation we live in, because we get the ability to make the choices that we feel at that time is the right choice. As the Democrat that I am, I did uh, uh, a vote for uh, Republican, because at that time, like some of the other ones, uh, other candidates that I've seen, other people that I've uh, visited and I've checked out through Van, have voted uh, Republican. I stand by my choice. I did not do anything wrong. I felt the candidate was the right one for me at that time, and that's why I voted. Thank you, because we are a democratic city. Thank you, Mr. Oye. <laughs> Ms. Oaxaca, you received credit in the media for some of the Colonia uh, projects recently. Previously, a story was done in the campaign about the fact that at the time, there were two candidates in the office that were uh, campaigning. During that story, you, were, you credited the hard work of then Commissioner Willy Gandra. At a recent forum, you then referred to him as an absent commissioner. So who deserves the credit for getting work done in the office and in the colonias, you or the former commissioner? The credit goes to the community leaders in that colonia. The credit goes to the people that organized, came forth, worked with not only myself, but many other elected officials and leaders at that time in order to get that colonial funding going. The credit goes to families like Mr. Chavez, Mr. Carvajal, and Mr. and so many other uh, women and men and children that got together and, and for many, many months put themselves in the front line of going and petitioning. It was not only myself and other folks out there and uh, in departments, but el credito va a toda esa gente que no tenía agua, a toda esa gente que se sacrificaba, those people that had to get up early in the morning and take their children to school, those, those kids that had to travel to grandparents, homes, and friends' houses to take a shower. The credit, I, like I said, yes, I take part of being involved in the community. I take part as an organizer. I take part at that time of working in an office under an administration. But the bottom line, without the community, there is no leaders and there is no elected officials. They are the government. Thank you. In light of the public corruption scandal that has plagued El Paso, what will, and this is a question to all the candidates, by the way. In light of the public corruption scandal that has plagued El Paso, what will you do specifically to rebuild the trust of the citizens of El Paso County? Well, I first have to say that I'm very proud to have been endorsed by the COPS Coalition, and that includes uh, the Sheriff's Association, 
the El Paso Municipal Officers Association, the National Border Patrol Council 1929, and CLEAP, Combined Law Enforcement of Texas. Um, my belief that work, the community needs to see action, hecho, in order for them to gain the trust. And that is why I am running for this office, because I believe and I know that folks gain the confidence when they see something come to fruition. And the number one thing I'm gonna do is include, engage the community to come forth and be part of the dialogues going on with, this, with the county when it comes to any kind of bond or any kind of, of, of project. Not only leave that to the department heads, but leave it also to the stakeholders of this community. Transparency and accountability are words. Actions is what makes the person. There's always going to be corruption out there. There's something, there's, we're not gonna be able to control, vamos a poder controlar la corrupción. It's up to us to have a choice of how to do it and engage more with the people that put us in office. Thank you. I've been campaigning for already over close to 11 months now. When I first started, cuando apenas comencé mi campaña, todo mi signs leyeron. Restore public trust. Tener la confianza del público otra vez. Ha sido difícil. Y eso le damos el crédito al que ha sido difícil a los que han estado en oficina o han trabajado en oficina. Los hechos, hablamos de los hechos. Por eso la comunidad está cansada ahorita de los mismos políticos. Porque los hechos no se han hecho hechos. Han sido habladas. Promesas y bajadas las estrellas de cosas que ni el comisionado tiene que ver. Los hechos hay que hacerlos. We need restoring public trust. The same old politicians have been making the promises. I'm not a politician. I've never been in office. I've been a hardworking individual that has shown proof of the companies I've worked for. And now I come to show the proof to my communities. I have the experience. I have everything that you need for a county commissioner. I am your next county commissioner. Thank you. Hey, Jeremy. I believe, you know, that my 47 years, as I mentioned a while ago, you know, I've been 37 years with the Colorado Public School District in many positions as uh, in charge of uh, construction, in charge of engineers, in charge of principals, uh, all the way from coaches, you know, being head coach, to doing many, many things. And uh, throughout those years, it's a as an administrator for Socorro Independent District, I was a protector of the taxpayers of Socorro Independent School District. I always made sure that that everything was above board, that the contracts that were given out were done in the correct manner. I had board members from time to time would come and ask me to, to do something that was not ethical or to uh, work with individuals, you know, and that were not ethical to the, the uh, to society, and uh, consequently, I was able to stay away from all of those. Never did get a handout as an uh, administrator. I'm not going to say that I didn't get a golf game, I mean, I didn't get a meal somewhere there, but never did I have my handout uh, and asking for a donation or anything. They did it on their own. And I went on to the Tornillo Water Board, and uh, a board member for Tornillo and School, I mean, Tornillo and ISD, or the town of Tornillo. We were able to bring water to the Colonia, which was a major Colonia, with the help of nobody. We had our own money. We were able to bring sewer. It took time, but uh, that little town of Tornillo, with the help, and uh, when I started as a uh, board member, we were able to bring many things to the table. And again, we're not, never were we chastised for working with individuals to take money. As a community college board member, when I went in there, there was a lot, a lot of uh, things going on, a lot of hands sticking out, people trying to get favors, and again, we were able to bring uh, integrity, bring clarity to the situation, and uh, four board members, which were there, 
which were, you know, Uxer, Haggerty, uh, Marquez, and Quintanilla, we made sure that we stayed above board and we did what was right for the community. Never took a handout. And when some of those people that believed that there was a handout to be given, offered to give them back their campaign donation, $100. I'll give you back your money because I'm going to do what's right. Thank you, Mr. Quintanilla. And as a state representative, let me just thank you. Time has expired. Thank so, you. Thank you. And Mr. Perez, never had any Representative handout. Quintanilla, your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I can tell you when I when I talk to people, um, you know, in their homes, uh, I think the level of trust between the people in our government is at an all-time low. Uh, I, I tell people often the story. I, I went to a man's uh, house. I knocked on his door and I told him, I said, "Hello, my name my name is Vince. I'm a candidate for county commissioner." And he said, ratones, todos, get off my lawn. And he told me to get off his lawn. He said, I'm not voting for any of you. And I think it's indicative of the anger it is that people are feeling, of uh, the level of mistrust. Uh, because I think every day when they open up the newspaper, they hear of a new case of, of whether it be public corruption or uh, scandals, and particularly the misuse of, of uh, public dollars. And I think it's very important. It's very uh, uh, frustrating for our community because being such a poor community, it's just our tax dollars are precious. Um, so first and foremost, I, I think we have all of us, whether whoever's elected, has a lot of work to do. Uh, I think you do that through active engagement. I think people appreciate it when you take the time to go and listen to them, when you go into their communities and hear from them directly. Uh, so I think first and foremost, having a good, strong, active engagement is, in, is important. I think secondly, I think as candidates, not just in this race, but in all races, have a responsibility to really temper our promises. And I think that's where a lot of the disappointment has come from. I think there's been a history of politicians who promise the moon and the stars to people, uh, and then when realistically we can't deliver because of the constraints of funds or other uh, realities, people get disappointed in our leadership. And so I think we all have to be responsible candidates in the way it is that we talk to our constituents and be honest about the promises that we can make and be honest about the challenges that exist. Um, and also, finally, I think as, as a county commissioner, I think all of us would have to support policies uh, that ensure transparency. The county is already working on a comprehensive long-term strategy uh, to ensure that departments are very open about their needs uh, so that we already have an idea of uh, department needs, the long-term plan of, of, for, for growth, and how we're going to address problems in our communities. Uh, so I think uh, it's going to be very important to establish policies and procedures uh, that not only promote transparency, but promote open government to the extent possible. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Uh, sticking with Mr. Perez, this is a question from our hosts. With talk of privatizing our local county jail, what is your stance on this issue? And how else do you plan on assisti assisting the law enforcement community? On uh, privatizing the jail, I, I, you know, it's a proposal I, I haven't, uh, I haven't heard of. But on my, whether it be parks, jails, uh, I, I'm very reluctant it is to pass that on to a private company because whenever you do that, uh, voters and taxpayers don't have uh, much of a voice. Uh, and I think when it comes to issues of public safety, uh, jails in particular, uh, or parks. Uh, I think it's, it's best when voters and the people have a say, and I think whenever you privatize, whether it be a park, whether it be a jail, or, or any other entity like that, you take, the, you take the power away from the people and you put it in the hands of a company and you put it in the hands of a few. Uh, so I think keeping our jails public uh, ensures accountability and, and keeps the power in, in the people's hands. Uh, public safety, you know, we're very fortunate to live in, in the safest city in the nation, over 500,000, uh, and I think that comes from great collaboration, and I think any law enforcement officer will tell you the level of cooperation of not only the sheriffs, Socorro police, tribal police, uh, the police department, along with uh, federal law enforcement, whether it be ICE, FBI, is, is just phenomenal. And, and that's why it is we're very fortunate to live in, in among the safest cities in the country. And it's not just El Paso, but it's among all the border cities, believe it or not, are among the safest in the country. And I think we get a bad rap from politicians in Washington and in Texas who put our community down, who look down on us. Um, so I would be a strong advocate for the law enforcement community to ensure that we're promoting their good work, uh, not just here in El Paso, but in Austin and in Washington, D.C. as well. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Perez. Representative Hitania, same question. <coughs> you know, I, I don't believe in privatizing the, the jail. The, you know, there's certain jails across the state of Texas there, which we would private, uh, privatize them. Constitutionally, the sheriff is the only person that needs to be elected in any county. Every county has to have a sheriff by constitution. And the, the sheriff is the only one that's mandated to run a jail. So consequently, it's under the offices, it's under the charge of the uh, sheriff that this must happen. 
So privatizing a jail would put the constitutional uh, constitution at hard way because the sheriff would sheriff's uh, charges would then be limited under a privatization. So there's certain things that I believe in privatizing, but jails is probably one of those things that uh, I would not uh, follow up and privatize simply because it is a charge that the counties must have, and it is one of the charges that community, I mean, kind of commissioners must uh, approve and must fund at, the, at that level. So the sheriff has done a great job. They've done a great job in the as said before, the office of the sheriff runs a tremendous jail. I think uh, if you've seen it on television, you've seen that uh, how well and how well trained these individuals are. So keeping uh, jail under the offices of the sheriff and not privatizing is the way to go. Thank you, Representative Quintanilla. Moving on, Mr. Loya. Having a family member that works for the federal prisons, that question I've asked him many times, how do you feel about privatization? He told me this, when they privatize, they don't train their people as well as the sheriff's department trains their people. Along with that said, if you look at more history, that inmates have escaped more from privatized organizations and jails than they have through our local government, I mean local uh, service department. We need to continue. As I've always said, it's not always about being a man that knows the budget very well, it's not always about cutting services. It's strictly about reorganizing and making them more efficient. I'm against that. I've always been against privatizing local, uh, our service department or any government entity that is run through the government just to give it out to somebody else. No, we have employees that have worked very hard, that have trained very hard, and for them to lose their jobs because those private companies will bring in their own people because they will pay them less. So I'm against it 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Loya. Ms. Oaxaca. Well, when I hear uh, privatization, I hear the word diluting quality services. And that's exactly what we will get. We will get poor quality from, uh, from an institution that is well served right now by our sheriff's officers and deputies. I, will, I earned uh, law, the law enforcement's endorsement. And this came up as well, this question. And, uh, and my, my answer to them is that I have a lot of respect for the law enforcement here in El Paso. We have one of the safest cities I want to be one of the safety's counties. And it's, it's them that we entrust with our children, with our homes, with ourselves, with our lives. And there's no way that I will ever hurt families that are working so hard and sacrificing their lives for us to privatize their jobs. It would be insane, it would be immoral for myself to do anything like that. And I would be the first one, whether I'm elected or not, to be with them and stand next to the men and women in uniform to protect their jobs and to protect our safety in this community. Thank you. Thank you. So the following questions, we're going to change the time to answer to one minute in the interest of getting through more questions uh, that we have from the audience. If elected, we'll start with Mr. Loya this time. If elected, what is the first act you will pursue on Commissioner's Court? When I get elected, the first thing I want to go look into is the budget. Why are we going and doing stuff in El Paso? Where is our money that is deserved in our communities? I want to know where our money has gone for our parks. I want to know where our money has gone for our lighting. I want to know where our money has gone for our streets. Lack of representation in so many years, where is our money when the budget is established on a yearly basis? That's what I want to do first, is I want to find out where our money, where we deserve, where my community deserves, in the Lower Valley, where the money has gone, and in Montana Vista. That's what I'm going to look at first. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Representative Quintanilla. One of the priorities that I would have, you know, is a, uh, when I become a commissioner, when I'm in there as a commissioner, is going to be to 
make sure that public safety becomes the number one issue. Of course, you've got other areas that you have heard, you know, uh, Judge uh, Veronica Escobar has come up with the legacy values that need to be put in place. And I really believe in those days, she talks about public safety infrastructure, health and welfare quality of life, administration, justice, mobility, and community and economic development. One of the things that she has forgotten is that for many, many years, county employees have not been considered or given any kind of uh, raise or in cost of living. What they have done throughout the last five, six years, or more, more than that, is that they've received time off, and you know, they give them more vacation, more vacation, but they keep losing money. So one of the first things that I would kind of look and you know, make it a priority would be to look at a budget that would uh, compensate people in the county. All of these legacies that are coming up, that are being put up by the county, uh, uh, county judge, Escobar are great. They are great things, but you must have employees. You must have employees that believe in county work and believe in what they are doing thank and you, believe Mr. those Mr. things. So that, I, I forgot about one minute. So thank you. Sorry, give you a little more, now, Mr. Perez. Oh. I said I gave you more. I'm not giving you more. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think first and foremost, what I would like to see done in, in my conversations again with, with voters uh, is, is a comprehensive needs assessment for infrastructure. Uh, too often times I talk with residents who say it is, they don't have basic roads. Uh, I, I was out in Montana Vista, there's multiple streets out there that where you come up to a four-way intersection, but there aren't any stop signs on any of them, and, and it poses a, a serious uh, public safety issue. Uh, and then there's also, uh, you know, basic needs for infrastructure for water and gas. And so I think if there was a comprehensive needs assessment uh, that was made available to the public, so that way policymakers and the public are all on the same page in terms of the list of priorities that every community in Precinct 3 is facing, I think is very important and will help increase transparency. Secondly, I, when, when January comes around, uh, the people need to be aware is that Socorro and much of the Lower Valley now falls in a different congressional district. I think many people are going to be very surprised when they go to the polls that they're, they're not going to be able to vote for Congressman Sylvester Reyes or, or Vetro work, uh, or work. The new congressman is going to be based out of San Antonio. And we're now going to have 100,000 residents in our best. community uh, represented by someone else. So I want to see if it's Thank possible you, for the Pettis. county to have a, an office. Thank you, Mr. Pettis. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Pettis. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask all of the uh, members of the panel to please respect the time limits. I respect each of you. Please respect my role here uh, as moderator. Uh, moving on. We'll go now with uh, Representative Quintanilla. I, I didn't answer I think question. I've heard all of you. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. You Ms. disrespected me. <laughs> no, I just can't see you from this end. Um, Ms. Oaxaca. Thank you. Yes. Uh, for the, because of that, I get an extra minute. Right? No, you're cutting your time's burning. Okay. Uh, the question was, what was going to be my first priority? And uh, I'm, I'm already working in, the, in my first priority. Just because we're not in office doesn't mean that we should be working towards getting every community their basic needs and infrastructure. Mi prioridad, como ahora estoy trabajando con las comunidades, señor Cabral, para el gas natural, it would be to identify every single area of our county with what are the gaps some, county, some communities in this county, some areas, do not have gas. Others don't have water. Others don't have sewer. And it's not that they, they, um, they're exempt from not, from, from not getting funding from the county, like some, some, some of my uh, opponents here, here stated. But you not always need the money. We've been able to accomplish uh, residential electricity just about three months ago up there in Horizon. And the county didn't have to be involved. What was involved, it was the community, it was your leader together, working with the electric company to get them that. The same goes with gas. It's being a voice, but it's also being creative and working in collaboration with other municipalities, with other government agencies, and with your utility services in order to ensure that everybody has basic Thank you, services. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. <laughs> Ms. Walker, I'm going to give you an, an additional 30 seconds because I have a follow-up. In a previous forum, you stated your first act if you were elected would be to uh, 
push forward domestic partner benefits. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to explain the discrepancy. Well, we were addressing that particular group. And it's not that I'm not gonna do it, it will be part of the agenda when, uh, when we get there. And it's one of the issues that needs to be respected because all human beings need to be treated equally. And I'm not gonna deny that. That is, one, that is going to be a policy priority. What this is, is a policy and project priority that the community needs the most. Not putting any priority in place, but this is what the people, this is what I'm already doing, Mr. Avedia. I'm already working, I am I'm hands on as we speak in two projects in our community that are gonna land our folks, our neighbors, gas and water. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miranda. Thank you. We'll continue with Representative Quintanilla. Uh, again, just a minute uh, to respond. Uh, do you support domestic partner benefits at the county level? <coughs> My uh, commitment is to the people of the county to uh, put it up to a vote to the people of the county and, and then go with the wishes of the majority. If the majority of the people in El Paso County believe that domestic partners should get those rights, then I will abide by them. But if they do not abide by that rule, then I should not uh, follow their wishes. As you know, as a state representative, I've always uh, voted very conservative on those issues and the issues of uh, Mr. Partnership. And the state of Texas allows for same-sex marriages and domestic partner benefits, then I will go with the wishes of the people. I always believe that the people, I, I love constitutional amendments because it gives people the right to vote yes or no on big issues across the state. Representative Quintanilla, I wanted to give you a, an additional 30 seconds to uh, actually clarify your answer there. How do you feel about domestic partner benefits? Not how would you act if the county <laughs> came up with it, but what is your position on that issue? I, I don't have a position on it. Like I said, I've always been a, 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 a politician that believes in the wishes of the people and respect the vote of the people. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative Quintanilla. Mr. Perez, yes, big question. Yes. I, I don't think that this is an issue. dozing off, or what, what was that about? <laughs> just, uh, just verifying. I don't think this is an issue about gay marriage, and, and I've been very vocal in this. Unfortunately, I think this issue has, has been hijacked by a very vocal minority. Um, as, as county commissioner, you know, we, we all have a responsibility to the health care of our employees uh, at the county. Uh, and something it is I mentioned previously is that I think that every county employee, whether you're gay, straight, w whatever, should have equal benefits. Uh, as a young person myself, you know, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not married, but why is it it is that only married couples get to designate, uh, get the extra benefit of having someone else on a health insurance policy? Uh, I, think, I think we need to examine uh, other policies because whether we like it or not, a lot of people these days are delaying marriage until they get older. Many people are choosing whether it be for financial reasons or otherwise. Uh, and show, we shouldn't sacrifice the health care of our employees just because it is they're not married. Uh, this is not a matter of uh, gay or straight or sanctioning gay marriage. We're not giving gay marriage license or anything like that. It's a matter of providing health care to people. And in a community where we have one in three people without health insurance, we need to do whatever we can to ensure that we get people into doctor's offices with health insurance and keep them out of Thompson Hospital and in the emergency room where taxpayers end up putting the bill. It's a very critical problem for our community. Thank you, Mr. It's going to continue over the long term. Okay, moving on to another uh, topic. We're gonna start with uh, Representative Quintanilla for the next question. The Ethics Commission. I'm sorry, but Mr. Loya didn't oh, I'm answer. sorry. Okay. Sorry, Paul. Mr. Loya. I know what you the My personal views on this. You guys are quick to fire people around <laughs> My personal view on this is being a person that is, is always on top of the budget, is always making sure to take care of the constituents' money, our taxes. It costs us a lot of money to just deny these benefits where they're going to end up in our emergency room at UMC. It's going to cost the taxpayers money. At that point, will you then, I'll turn it back to you, will you then decide to give them the benefits when it's coming out of your pocket? The equality of life, we need to respect the equality, whether it's your choice or their choice. We're not always right. 
It's not always it's our choice, it's what works. If the individual decides same-sex marriage or partnership, we need to respect that. I'm not here to judge. I'm here to take care of our communities. I'm here to watch out for your money. I'm here to make sure that they get the benefits that they deserve instead of just spending the money in the emergency room. For even a simple cold, they'll run there and we'll pay for it. We need to respect each other. We are... Thank you, Mr. Lund. Thank you. Okay, everybody had a chance to answer that one, correct? Just double checking my math here. Okay, moving right along. Um, I've interviewed each of you um, at some point or another down the campaign trail, and I've heard all of you talk about the importance of bringing resources to uh, Precinct 3. But political reality is with the tight budget at the county level that they're postured towards cuts as opposed to bringing any, uh, any expenditures to this precinct. So what specific actions will you take in order to bring those resources and infrastructure to the precinct? We'll begin with Representative Quintanilla. Thank you. Uh, you know, it, the county for the last few years has, has maintained a budget that is not very conducive to the needs of the valley. As you all know, you know, there's uh, the courts in El Paso have not collected many, many fine, fines that have been put out there. We're talking to uh, JPs across the county and JP Rohan, you know, there's thousands and thousands of dollars out there. Talking to Del Abriones, you know, they're trying to find a way of getting more money into the, the coffers. What we need to do is make sure that we have a system in place that allows for collection of these fines. I don't believe in fines being left out there alone and nobody collecting on it. I believe the constables, and I think one of the constables is running right now for the position, will do that and, uh, and bring more money to the coffers. It, it, interesting that uh, Judge Escobar is proposing a two cent tax increase. I believe that the Lower Valley and the outside of the part of the county is a poor area and the amount of money that is generated is very low. But if you raise one cent across the county, you will bring in $38 million. Those $38 million would go a long ways and there would be only one penny of tax that would be uh, imposed to the people. Two pennies would bring you over $70,000, $70 million, which would do wonders for everything that we have in the county and, and provide for it the quality of life that we have the need for in the valley. Green space areas, uh, again, working with other individuals to bring the needs to the community that are very evident in that they don't have gas, water, and in, in, in certain areas, electricity. I really believe that we need to continue to work with uh, the constituents, you know, uh, quality of life bonds. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kinsley. Uh, support. Thank you, Mr. Quintanilla. I'm going to go ahead and give you all two minutes as I gave Representative Quintanilla because it's a little bit more complex of a question. Mr. Pettis. Uh, you know, in my discussions with, with business people, I can tell you one, thing, one area it is where we may be, there may be an opportunity to help raise revenue. Uh, you know, with an NAFTA agreement, trucks from Mexico are allowed to come into the United States. Uh, and one problem that I'm hearing too often uh, from local trucking truck companies is that trucks from Mexico uh, when they come over to the United States, are supposed to drop off their load in the United States and go back to Mexico with an empty load. Uh, that's the agreement under NAFTA. Unfortunately, what I hear it is that's happening, and this is why we require more, more work to be looked into this, is that uh, the trucks are not just going straight back to Mexico. Uh, they're going to deliver local hauls from businesses from one point to another, costing the jobs uh, of local American companies who pay their taxes. Um, so the county in particular is lo losing a lot of revenue on these trucks it is that aren't returning back to Mexico, but that are delivering hauls from one point to another here in the United States. Uh, so that's something that I intend to look into as a commissioner. Uh, but secondly, and something it is that I've emphasized, is this goes to the importance of advocacy. The power of the county commissioners are very limited. Uh, and that's why it is we need a commissioner who's committed to being a strong advocate. And a lot of that fight is taken to Austin. The state has cut $27 billion from the budget, and that's putting a lot of pressure on local governments uh, to raise taxes. And I was very disappointed that the previous commissioner did not lobby, did not testify between how, uh, 
of the House committees in Austin on behalf of his constituents. That's something that has to be done. We need commissioners who do their homework, who are willing to work hard, and to take the fight not just here locally at commissioner's court, but to the people in Austin who, act, who, who are responsible for our tax dollars at the state level. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Ms. Oaxaca. Yes, well, when it comes to, to, um, to looking at the community and assessing what is needed in order for, for the community to gain more, I go back to what I've been practicing, and that's collaboration between the community and other entities and municipalities. I have a track record. You don't need money, at least not county money up front, in order to get people their electric, electricity running. I've worked uh, with, uh, with, uh, with folks out here just, tr just uh, defining and a plan on how to get natural gas without having the county involved directly with any funding. And that is coming to a fruition in two months because there are programs out there. So you need a commissioner, like I was a staffer out there and I was not a commissioner and I was already doing this in order to get these folks what they needed the most, whether it be electricity, whether it be gas, whether it be water. You have to be able to know and have a relationship with these organizations and the folks that are running these entities because they will come to the table with you. They will be able to appropriate that money to the county, but if the county doesn't ask, if the county returns funding, if the county is not aggressive when it comes to an open window where there's grants available to do the work, then we are going to be left out again. You need somebody like myself that is going to be working day in and day out in order to be able to, to develop a plan, and not only a plan, but to ensure that those monies are there in order to come in and avoid the county taxpayers to pay and flip the bill when there's already money out there that we haven't tapped into. And that's been something that the county has not been able to address aggressively, perhaps because we don't have a strong grant department to do it, and that's something that is definitely needed in order to help bring up the community to Thank par you, in Walker. equality of basic services. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Walker. Mr. Lawyer, same question. Infrastructure. We need infrastructure. We need to work with our locals. We need to work with the city representatives of Socorro. We need to work with the city representatives of Clint. We need to continue our efforts to move forward. We talk about programs about water, sewers, and everything, and yet for 72 years, there's a part of Horizon that has not had sewer. Why did we fail to do that? Talking to the constituents there, they said they've seeked out to our representatives Nothing was done, been ignored. We need to be a commissioner that is willing to get into the trenches. I am that commissioner. I will get into the trenches. I will resolve finally the situation in Horizon Street right here. Everybody else has that, but that little portion of Horizon, we've ignored. We need to come back and we need to take care of that people because they've been there for 72 years already. They paid their, their taxes, they paid on time everything, and yet we failed to accomplish getting them a simple basic of sewage. Port of Entry that's coming in Tornillo is gonna give a big opportunity for us to bring in infrastructure, bring in local businesses. I hear some of my, my uh, opponents here they have no experience on opening their own little business. How what it takes to open up a business. It's not always about money. You need money to open up a business. But you need to know the right people. You need the connection. You need to get out there. That's why I'm telling you, I am the best candidate here because I've been a business owner. I know what it takes to make a street from the bottom to the final. Thank you, Mr. Lawyer. Thank you. Okay, we're going back to we're going back to one minute, um, and we're going moving into the questions submitted by the audience. So don't blame me for the questions. That's what I'm trying to say there, uh, and we'll start with Mr. Perez. What skills 
Do you bring the city of Socorro if the previous person didn't do anything for the city? Well, I, I, again, I think it goes back to active engagement, and I think uh, it's very important to have a commissioner who's willing to uh, meet with <laughs> residents of all parts. And, and, you know, Precinct 3 is the largest precinct geographically, uh, not only including the city of Socorro, but, you know, in, in the area of the precinct that I live by, Bellar High School, includes all the feeder patterns from Isleta, Del Valle, uh, goes all the way to Tornillo, then all the way up to Montana Vista, Montana Vista and Waco, Waco Tanks. So, uh, you know, I think it's very important to have a commissioner it is who's uh, willing to have active and, and numerous town hall meetings. Uh, I, I believe it is that nowadays uh, we don't have that sort of uh, same level of engagement from our commissioners with the constituents. Um, so I think having, uh, you know, regular town hall meetings, making yourself accessible. Uh, you know, when I go door to door, I leave my cell phone number. So anybody that I go talk to, and, uh, you know, they have access to my personal cell. I think uh, with the great needs of, of this precinct, uh, that's the kind of engagement it is that you need to have, uh, you know, working not only with the city of El Paso, with the city of Socorro, the city of Horizon, uh, you know, there's lots of different entities, and that's the thing that makes Precinct 3 unique. Ms. Oaxaca. Working with the city of Socorro and the county, I think that uh, the best would be to start a dialogue with the city council, number one, and number two, start a cost-sharing uh, project with them. Uh, whether it be parks, um, the county already has a track record in working with the uh, Fabens Independent School District and the Independent School District in, in building the park, and then the city takes over the maintenance and operation. That would be one of them. Uh, I believe that right now what the, city, the citizens of Socorro and I live here is, is gain back the trust, and we're going to have to do it united and, and set aside all differences, all politics, all type of personality differences, and come together with one agenda that is going to benefit not only every citizen here, but mostly our children, because those are the ones that are going to inherit and suffer any kind of political driven agenda that is not set well for them. And before we do anything, you, as politicians, 
we need to think of our young and our old. Thank you. I keep hearing about we need to start working with the city of Socorro. I have been working with the city of Socorro. I've been involved in their projects. They have tremendous amount of projects that are going to be very, very beneficial to the citizens of Socorro. With that in mind, we need to also bring in those projects into the remainder of our county. Sometimes the credit isn't given because of a name recognition, because of one individual that made a mistake. We accuse the rest of the family as, as if they're part of that corruption. There are representatives that have been here in the city of Socorro that have been doing an outstanding job. And you all know who I'm talking about. I don't have to remain in the name. But we need to be careful as to what we say about the whole name of the Gandaras because some of them are working extremely hard and doing a great job for our community. We need to give them the respect because we're not all perfect. We all make mistakes. Thank you, Mr. Royal. Thank you. Representative Kitanian. Yes, unfortunately, you know, I mean, we have to have a council, and we do have a council here in Socorro now that is working toward uh, making uh, Socorro a much better place to live in. Uh, you know, it, uh, people get chastised for doing those things, and uh, I believe that uh, the city of Socorro can enter into many interlocal agreements with the county, where the county will provide a lot of the services at a lower cost to the citizens of Socorro, and their one dollar would go much longer ways, you know. Uh, we have, uh, through the years, my office is a state representative, we've worked with the council and, and worked with them in areas of uh, getting grants, making sure that they got money for parks, you know, they got money for building uh, infrastructure, you know, and it's a slow process, but we, I believe that this can be accomplished simply by working with the county, and the county is there to intervene, not to give away, but in many cases, everybody just uh, go up, comes up with the idea that, well, no, it's not a county, it's not part of the county, it's a city of Socorro. But there's ways to do it. I, I always feel bad when people come around and tell me, no, we can't do it because. It's Thank always you. some way you can do it. And I think interlocal inter agreements with uh, the you, municipalities is a great thing. Next question, we'll start with uh, Ms. Oaxaca. Are Precinct 3 communities continue to fall prey to those land sellers who advertise lot sales at affordable prices? In reality, some of the constituents we serve have been paying for seven years on a parcel of land that they bought for $30,000 and still owe $29,500. How do you commit yourself to solve some of the worst predatory lending issues in the state? Ms. Oaxaca. Well, it's a coincidence that you asked that. Just this morning, I was talking to a, uh, a resident, a neighbor, about that same, uh, that same problem that we're having. We have a lot, uh, we have a lot of predatory lending. We have, uh, we have folks that have their land, and they're subdividing and planning it, and selling these, uh, these so-called uh, lots for lots of money. And, uh, and these folks seem like they're never gonna end up paying. So my role is to be extremely active in the legislature as a, as a commissioner and active with the community in terms of ensuring that these type of, of trends, and it's a trend that goes out here in the community, stops. And, uh, and we see it very often. Um, just drive down Socorro Road, you're going to see these lots, you know, uh, for $35,000, you know, self financing, you know, owner financing. And that's the worst that anybody can do because it's, some, it's something that they're never going to be able to pay if they don't get their, 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 uh, their credit fixed. And uh, as part of that, I think we need to be very, very uh, engaged I'm also uh, with uh, housing issues and credit affordability. Okay. Mr. Loya. Again, here we go categorizing everybody as, as they're selling them and they'll never get you know, finalization on their paperwork on that. There's nothing wrong with an individual selling its property and dividing it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's up to us that are buying these properties to read the paperwork right and not just sign on the dotted line because our credit has been shot. 
It's our responsibility. They're going to sell. It's our responsibility to buy. There's nothing that's illegal to say, I'm going to charge you 23% interest. There's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong with that is the individual signing the paper and agreeing to that. That's where the problem is. It's up to the individual to make a decision to say, I refuse to pay 23%. I will fix my credit. We all have mistakes. We all fall under certain circumstances that our credit goes bad. But it's up to the individual not just to sign on a dotted line and then later on come back and say, I didn't know. Take somebody that Thank knows you, and do it the right way. Representative Thank you. Quintanilla. You know, uh, for many years, uh, colonials were uh, made available or grew up in this uh, community and the community in El Paso County. And uh, there was a lot of scrupulous lenders out there that took advantage of many individuals and still taking advantage of those people. There's laws in the books now under the colonial law of 1995 to where now you cannot subdivide unless you follow the certain colonial rules. One of the things that happens right now is that if you try to subdivide in a plot, you must get permission from the county under the colonial rule that is mandated by the state of Texas. There is uh, contracts of sales still out there, but I know the state of Texas and uh, different organizations are going out there and buying those uh, contracts of sale that uh, had a high interest rate. I think we have some individuals in here that work in that those areas where people are getting an opportunity. It's just that they find a way to get to those people and then get them to buy their contract from those unscrupulous individuals that aren't giving out that much uh, interest on the individual. Thank you, so, Predatory lending on the whole is just a very serious problem for our community, um, you know, not just as it pertains to the subdivision of land, but, but also, I mean, all over El Paso, and particularly here in the Valley, you'll see these loan shops that just set up where uh, they promise easy loans, no credit checks, uh, and, and unfortunately, you know, given the, the income levels of, of the area, uh, people fall susceptible to, these, uh, to this easy money and, uh, you know, end up realizing later that they have to pay 25% interest. Uh, but it's, it's a very serious problem, and again, you know, as county commissioners, you know, we are often just powerless because we have to just enforce the laws that the state allows us to enforce. Uh, but it goes back to uh, having a commissioner this who can highlight the unique situation it is that I think we have here in El Paso where I feel that people here are victimized to a greater extent than other parts of the state. Uh, people, I mean, yes, it is the, the responsibility of the consumer, but a lot of times, I mean, people are just taken advantage of uh, for the sake of a profit by another individual. Uh, and so we need to promote laws it is that protect individuals from these types of circumstances. Uh, and a commissioner it is who can articulate those needs uh, of this area to the state level because ultimately it's our state legislators it is that Thank really you, have Mr. to crack down these types of practices. All right. Moving on, we're going to start uh, this particular round with Mr. Loya. <laughs> Law enforcement and public safety are some of the biggest expenditures for the county and the city of El Paso. Would you support consolidation of those services as a tax-saving measure? Uh, that's a tough one there because I think that right now our local uh, law enforcement is working with the sheriff's department. They were already working together. So does that mean that every entity needs to work together? Then we're going to have police departments running all crazy, not knowing the jurisdiction. We need to continue to support the jurisdiction, just like the, the, the police department in Socorro has their area covered. The police department in El Paso has their area covered. Clint department has their area covered. We need to continue working with the sheriff's department so they can assist all our communities. Make it a little bit stronger. We don't have the manpower right now because of the budget cuts. We don't have the manpower to have a police officer constantly riding around in our streets just because we don't have the money. We talk about raising taxes and everybody jumps. But if it's because of having public service... Thank you, Mr. Lyon. Thank you. Representative Quintanilla. You know, in the, uh, two sessions ago, uh, I introduced or worked with the communities or the different uh, police agencies, uh, sheriff, uh, PD, in the different entities or different PDs across the county. I was trying to get them together to see if we could come with a consolidation effort because, as you well know, the only person that's mandated to be a 
policeman in this county is a sheriff. We're the only one, then the sheriff and the constables. They are the only constitutional mandated uh, officers on the books of the state of Texas. And I believe that if we did a proper way of consolidating these, you know, forces, it would bring up a, 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 a much better protected society or where our society will be much better protected across the county. That being said, there is a lot of hurdles to be tackled and it would be a long, long term process that I would get involved with the different entities to come up with some kind of solution, not in one year, two years or three years, but maybe for the long run. Thank you, Representative Vitaniano. Mr. Perez. You know, the consolidation of resources is, is a very hot topic, uh, and the reason that it is is because of the cuts it is that we face at the state level. Uh, you know, the state has cut $27 billion, as I said, you know, putting a lot of pressure on local governments. Uh, in the county in particular, you know, there's only two ways it is that revenue can be raised, uh, and that's number one, through property taxes, uh, and number two, through sales taxes. Uh, you know, we don't have much control over how much sales taxes uh, comes in year after year. You know, it's going to all be dependent on the economy. Uh, so consolidating resources uh, is something it is that's going to be, it's, it's really the wave of, of what's going to be looked at several years from now because that's one of the few ways it is that we can explore cost savings. Uh, you know, if there's areas it is where we can provide uh, services between the city and the county, whether it be in areas of public safety, whether it be in areas of park management, uh, that's something that's going to really need to be looked into very carefully uh, by bringing all the parties together to, to look at this. I mean, you know, there are different... You know, different agencies have different objections to it, uh, but these, these are the hard conversations it is that we're going to have uh, in the years ahead, uh, you know, and, and the types of things that are going to gonna need to be done to avoid property tax increases on people. Ms. Oaxaca. Very simple, I'm against consolidation, and be, we, before we start talks about consolidation here in El Paso, I think uh, I want to see the state do it first, maybe if they want to start consolidating their Texas Rangers with their troopers, then uh, we can follow up, but at this time, I believe that all the state agencies should be, you know, all our law enforcement agencies should be compartmentalized. Um, checks and balances is one of them. I, um, I support whatever law enforcement says. If law enforcement wants uh, to, to, uh, to take a stand on pro-consolidating themselves, then we should follow suit. They are the people that put their lives on the line for us, and, uh, and I respect that. Thank you, Ms. Walker. We have time for a couple more Yes, I'm assuming yes. yes. All right, so we're going to do two more questions. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Perez. If elected, would you consider placing an international bridge in the city of Socorro as the one being built in Bormio? You know, that, I mean, that's an issue it is that it's going to have to be discussed with residents. I can tell you there's a lot of controversy right now surrounding the, the Yarborough Bridge. Uh, and, you know, I myself, I live three houses off of Yarborough, so if there were an international bridge that were to be constructed on Yarborough, you know, my, my house would certainly be affected. And, and the residents in, in that area are very vehemently opposed uh, to that effort. Uh, so it's going to require something that's going to require engagement with the residents if, if it's something it is that they're, they're opposed to. Uh, it's, it's the responsibility of the county commissioner to work with other representatives to make sure it is that, that the will of the residents is heard. You know, too often times in these cases, uh, you know, you have powerful business interests, you know, those who want the bridge constructed, you know, business folks who want a bridge constructed. Uh, and they don't really, you know, bother to think much about the needs of the residents of people who have lived there 40, 50 years. Uh, and, and I can tell you in my case of uh, living there on, on Yarborough Street, it's, it's something it is that we're adamantly opposed to. Uh, and, and, and the needs of the residents need to be respected in any uh, infrastructure project that could disrupt you know, their everyday lives. So Thank you, Mr. Perez. Ms. Oaxaca. I believe that the community needs to voice their opinion on this before uh, your commissioner can be uh, endorsing any kind of bridge in this community. Lo que estoy hablando es de la, de que se hace un puente aquí en Socorro, ¿cómo me sentiría yo? Y si lo apoyaría y no es en la comunidad y eso va a pasar uh, en Yarbrough ahorita hay mucho movimiento allí se ha negado mucha gente lo igual se puede negar aquí como para ver, tenemos que ver tenemos que, que saber el balance we need to know how it's going to affect the community the pros and the cons there has to be a SWOT analysis not from us but also to the community and how they feel it's it's the it's the future that that um, 
that we need to take care of, but at the same time, it's the people that are gonna be affected that live here, the ones that, that is our responsibility to take care of first time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oaxaca. I don't think that we need to be talking about a bridge right now because we have the Tornillo Port of Entry already opening up. Many of us have traveled to Juarez and back at one point or another. And what do we see? They have a bridge of 10 lanes, 20 lanes, 15 lanes, whatever. And how many are open? Half of that. What's the point in, in already spending so much money on another bridge when we can utilize that money and spend it on what our constituents need? on what they fail to receive as equal opportunity of life. We need to focus on them, not so much the international bridges. They're not always open, all their, their gates are always open. We don't need to be talking about a bridge right now. We need to finish the one at, at Tornillo, and then we'll talk about a bridge way later on. We don't have that travel anymore of going back and forth. A lot of us don't go to Juarez anymore due to the violence. So what's the point in making another bridge and already sending other, uh, our community members because we're gonna do NMN domain and get rid of their houses and have them search for a new home somewhere else. Thank you, Mr. Lyon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, I, I, I really believe, you know, that trade with Mexico is gonna continue growing. Uh, a Tornillo Bridge is going to be a boom to the Tornillo area. The property values have already begun to increase. People are looking. Out there, I was able to pass a law and put it in the books, uh, create a municipal uh, tax district in Tornillo of a thousand uh, acres out there. So people out of Houston already believe in this. I believe that if we were able to put a bridge, which the MPO Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is the MPO, has already looked at a 2030 plan where they were looking for a bridge somewhere in the area right here that we're at that would go across Vineyard. As a matter of fact, this street right here in front of it would be the direct route for a bridge that would come across from Mexico. I believe that there's so much traffic and it would bring a boom to our community because those type of buildings that come into a community that provide for services and uh, are, they don't bring uh, children to the community. They bring space that can be taxed at a higher rate and, uh, it's not a bedroom community, so there would be a great boom. So it takes Thank about eight years to the planning organization. So we need to Thank start Thank you, Representative Quintanilla. Final question. Uh, we will start with, uh, we'll start with Ms. Oaxaca. Uh, explain what you bring to the table that your opponents do not. I bring to the table the experience of hands-on working with the community leaders that are here today, and I want them to rise. Mr. Cabral, uh, Senora Villelma, por favor, levantense, Maria. Those are the people that are working in our communities. And I bring in not only the experience that I've shared working with the neighbors, with our neighbors, with the community leaders of Socorro, Montana Vista, Agua Dulce, San Elisario, Mission Hills. But it's really the experience of collaboration and ensuring that the plans move forward. That when there is a problem, there will be a solution. And I've already demonstrated that with my actions, with my work. I'm not endorsing myself for this. The community brought me forward to run for this position. Thank you. Thank you. What I bring to the table is honesty, transparency, good ethics. That's what I bring to the table. That's what we lacked and we've been lacking in, in the past. I bring the experience of budgeting, of running a company and making it profitable. That's what I want to do is make our county profitable. Where we don't have to continue to raise taxes like we have. But we don't have to continue to depend on the people. Let it be self-efficient, control the budget, reorganize the departments, make them efficient. Efficiency, it's what it's about, efficiency. Holding people accountable for the jobs they hold. That's what I bring to the table. That's what I bring to our communities. 
everything that they well deserve and what they lacked in the past. That's what I bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brian. I bring to the table, you know, a lot of experience. Experience of working with the community for many, many years. I've worked with this community. I've seen this community of Socorro grow from a population of 700 students at uh, Socorro High School and uh, the whole school district to a population of 32,000 and well over 44,000 in the community now. So I bring a lot of experience to the community. I've worked with many individuals, many organizations, organizations that like those that Maria that was pointed out a while ago, where they work for the betterment of the community, the improving the quality of life. I love to see the quality of life improve by bringing in builders that will build beautiful homes for the community. By building beautiful homes, the, pro the uh, property values are increased and the quality of life for the individuals is much better for all. So uh, to the community, I bring a lot of experience, you know, 47 years of experience, 37 in uh, public education and the rest in the, uh, within those same years is service to my community. And I think uh, my service to community is more than the ages of the student, the, uh, the, uh, the candidate Thank you. that I'm here with. Me. Thank you, Mr. Quintanilla. Uh, you know, as, as I mentioned previously, I, I really think there's a crisis of, crust, of trust in this community and uh, the people just really don't know who to believe. And, and I think uh, they're really hoping for someone it is who can restore faith in government. Uh, and I think what I bring to the table is that I'm a different candidate. You know, I haven't held prior office, and I think that's precisely what people are looking for right now. They're looking for someone who's honest, there's someone who's willing to work hard. I had the opportunity to, to get a good education, uh, but I always wanted to come back. And when I was there at Georgetown, they instilled a strong sense of public service and a, and a, and a devotion to the common good. Uh, and that's why, unlike so many of my peers who don't return, I wanted to buck that trend and make that difference. And I think people are looking for someone it is who they can be proud of, someone it is who they can look up to, and someone who it is their kids can look up to. And I certainly hope to bring that uh, same passion for my community, that same desire to work hard uh, as the next county commissioner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Perez. <laughs> All right, we will now have a two-minute closing statement from each of the candidates. Ms. Oaxaca. Well, I want to thank everyone for being here. I, I really want to thank uh, Mr. Loya and Mr. Quintanilla for being gentlemen in this race, for being a good, uh, good opponents, and for, for really delivering a very positive campaign to the community uh, in order for us to get more folks out to vote. And that is what is important here, is that we don't turn off people, but we turn on people to the polls. And whether any of us out here becomes your next commissioner, I am going to be committed to work with everyone, as your commissioner, as a community leader, as a citizen from Socorro, as a citizen from this county. And that is what is important, that we all together join for a positive and progressive, proactive campaign season and, and, and be courteous to one another and not distort one another's families or, or misinform the voters in order to get them. Because if you have the capability of playing dirty, then you're gonna have the capability of being a dirty commissioner. And that is it. Yeah. That is what people don't want anymore. They wanna gain trust by actions, by leadership, by proactiveness, by faith. And that's why I thank you, Mr. Loya. I thank you, Mr. Quintanilla, because you have really put out yourself out there to turn on the vote. And that's what I want to do. Turn on the vote in a week, and may we all go out there, and we're going to be campaigning next to each other, and let the good old days come back, where we used to share tacos, tripitas at the campaign, at the, at the, at the absentee uh, voting booth, and, and lure the people. Lure the people to come out and vote for the best person you, to do this job. Thank you, Ms. Well, I want to thank you and thank the city council and thank the uh, uh, Socorro Police Department for putting this together. As you can see, we all have our own supporters and we all believe in, as long as we stay focused and stay focused in the mission, and the mission is to bring equality to our community. 
bring back what is well deserved to our community. If we can stay focused and we can sit up here and not be stabbing each other, that makes you a good candidate. That means you're ready to work with the people. We can all get together. I get along with all of them. All of them. But my focus is, and it's been focused since I started my campaign, restore public trust. Because without the public, we cannot get elected. Without the public, we cannot continue our goals and our efforts. We thank you, the public, for reaching out to us. Regardless who your next county commissioner is, we need to support them. Whether it's somebody on my left or somebody on my right, I will stand to support them because it's talking about my community. They will represent my community. I know they don't have a chance against me. <laughs> I will be the next county commissioner. So I ask them to support me because our vision is the same one. It's for our community. And as long as we can stay focused in our vision, we will prosper together. Not because we support this one or that one, because we support the vision. And that's to improve our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you Jaime, and I want to thank everybody here for you know, taking out a busy schedule to come out and uh, be with us and listen to our, our rhetoric about what, why we want to be commissioners. So, you know, I often uh, agree with uh, uh, Ms. Oaxaca and that I, I'm a golfer, you know, I'm a golfer. And when I play golf with somebody, I always know what type of individual they are by the way they play the game. If they play it fair and they do what is by the rules, it is always a great individual that I know I can depend on. I also know that, you know, if an individual cheats and, and does, he's only cheating himself, and if you don't cheat me for a one kid said bet, Judge Johan, you know how we play the game. You must play by an honorable system. And I also believe that when you're out there, you must do everything with honor and respect your fellow men and individuals. I will never, never, I was the only one of you, all four of us here, that took a pledge not to do any campaigning, any dirty campaigning. I signed the pledge of the so I do believe that I bring a lot to the table in all my years. I have never had or been called on the carpet. I have already seen some of us individuals, or one of us individuals has already taken a bite of the apple by going to Tornillo and, uh, and offering to see what is going on in Tornillo. You were going to ask me a question about ethics. Well, ethics is very important in our community, and when somebody goes and gets uh, promoted, to try to do unethical things that are not within the law, it, it, it is pretty hard for me to understand that they will be a great commissioner. I do believe that I will bring the experience and all the knowledge that is needed to be the commissioner that the Lower Valley needs and should be left in the Lower Valley. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> Mr. Pettis. Thank you very much. You know what I will say is that the people of our community today in Precinct 3 are poorer today than they were 10 years ago. Poverty rates are higher today than they were 10 years ago. Our dropout rates in high school today are higher than they were 10 years ago and is double the national average. And the reason why it is that we do not progress in this precinct is because we have had a history of leaders who disappoint us. Of leaders as we have seen in the newspapers who take advantage of the people of leaders in school districts who take advantage of children, of leaders who take advantage of taxpayer dollars. And I am unapologetic, it is that I am going to hold those individuals accountable who have helped put in these leaders who have disappointed our community because I feel it is, that is why it is, we are where we are today and we are not progressing. So if I'm sorry if it is that I hold those individuals accountable, Mayor Gondara disappointed the people, Commissioner Gondara have disappointed the people, and the person that who put them into office, I believe, will disappoint us as well. And so I'm unapologetic for that because this community deserves better, and I intend to fight for these people that have been for too long taken advantage of by a cycle of failed leadership, and that's what I intend to change as county commissioner. You're wrong. Thank you very much.
I appreciate your time here. I appreciate that we're all civil and we all get along really nicely. As is the tradition in the Grand City of Sapporo. Ladies and gentlemen, give a big round of applause for your candidates. Also, give a round of applause for the people that protect us. Thank you, leaders.